Hey, so what's up guys? Welcome back to True Crime Tutorial, episode two. Today we're gonna be talking about Jane Tobin. I alluded to her last week in the first episode about Lavinia Fisher. So I figured, hey, why not just go ahead with Jane Tobin, the very first female serial killer ever. Possibly even the very first serial killer ever. So today we are going to be doing a tutorial as best as I know how on how I do my hair. Now I just bought these so I've never actually used these before. But there's some small ones in here and there's some big ones in here. Don't see any medium sized ones, but I've seen these on YouTube and I've been wanting to try them. Apparently you're just like supposed to wrap your hair around them and then fold them in like that. First, I'm going to show y'all what I'm going to wash my hair with and then we'll do a big washy washy condition condition and we'll get started. So here we go. So Jane Tobin was born in 1857. Ha! and conditioner. Do big washi, come back. Back from the shower. So Jane Tobin, born in 1857, was known as Jolly Jane Tobin. It was one of her nicknames. She was born in Massachusetts. She is known to have killed at least 31 people between the years of 1880 and 1901 was kind of her killing spree area that she operated in. In court later on, she claimed that her life goal was to quote, have killed more people, helpless people, than any other man or woman who ever lived. But despite all of that, doctors thought that she was one of their best nurses. She was a nurse. <laughs> so with her family, she was the youngest of four girls in a poor Irish immigrant family. Wow, my lips are really chapped right now. Her mom, Bridget Kelly, died of tuberculosis when she was one. There we go. Yeah, that's what I'm using. Her father's name was Peter Kelly. He was a tailor, but said that he lost his mind and he sewed his eyelids shut. That was Jane Tobin's dad. So before that happened though, he raised the kids, raised Jane and her siblings. His nickname, Peter Kelly's name, was uh, Kelly the Crack, and he was actually suspected of abusing Jane and her siblings. So, moving on to Jane's childhood, she was actually born as Honora Kelly in 1857 in Boston, Massachusetts. She had what you would call an unstable childhood. So, in 1863, let's see if I can figure out how to do this. I don't even know how to do this, guys. I don't even think my is long enough to do this. Y'all, this is not gonna go well. So in 1863, Peter Kelly took Delia, which was Jane's, or I guess Nora, but it's the same person. So we're just gonna call her Nora at this point. Nora Kelly is Jane Tobin, just keep that. Peter Kelly took Nora, who was six at the time, and Delia, who was eight, to a female asylum, Boston's female asylum. Not an insane asylum, it was like a orphanage type thing. <laughs> this is gonna look so bad. So this asylum placed girls in respectable families when they turned 10, supposedly. This is not gonna go well at all, guys. Both Nora and Delia were raised alongside a bunch of other children. Nora was fostered as an indentured servant to widow Anne C. Topin, who changed Nora's name to Jane. The Topins passed her off as an Italian girl whose parents died at sea because there was some stigma associated with the Irish at that time. Don't know what that was or why that was such a big deal. Delia was sent to the streets for prostitution when she became old enough and she became an alcoholic. That one keeps coming out and I'm upset. Another sister of Nora's, her name was Nellie and she, we don't really know much about her. <laughs> and what happened? But long story short with her, she ended up in an insane asylum. So Jane, when she was living with the Topins, she did well in school. She had a ton of friends, but gradually over the course of time, she became quote, unattractively fat. So then she started to display some popular earmarks of 
being a sociopath, such as chronic lying. She could not stop lying, apparently. She would tell her friends at school that her father sailed around the world, that her sister married an English nobleman, and that her brother was decorated at Gettysburg by Abraham Lincoln himself. So that's obviously concerning for a child to be lying like that. But anyways, moving on to her adolescent years. At 18, she graduated from Lowell High School and she was freed of her duties with the Topins, but she wanted to still work for Anne as a servant until Anne died. Anne's daughter, Elizabeth, Jane's foster sister, ended up taking over the house and treated Jane as a servant. But she was nicer than Anne Topin. Was. So Anne's daughter Elizabeth ended up marrying a church deacon named Ormel Brigham and he ended up moving into the Topin house. But some dispute caused Jane to move out after living there for nearly 20 years. We don't know what that dispute was, but you'll see her history with Elizabeth and Ormel later on. So at 33, Jane started her training at Cambridge Hospital in 1887 as a nurse. I think that's a great idea. So during her time as a nurse, Jane earned her nickname Jolly Jane at Cambridge Hospital for her friendly and outgoing personality. But on top of that, she gossiped a whole lot. She would celebrate the dismissal of her fellow students if she didn't like them. And she also lied that the Tsar of Russia had offered her a nursing job. She stole, and in all of this, many of her fellow students grew to detest her. The hospital administration became concerned with her obsession with autopsies. She also falsified her patient's medical records in order to keep them in the hospital longer so she could get to know them. She apparently had strong feelings towards her elderly patients and she felt that they were useless and not worth keeping alive. That's the tea. So she had a patient named Amelia Finney and Amelia had an operation in 1887. She remembered afterward Jane giving her a dose of a bitter medicine that caused her to lose consciousness. And while she was unconscious, Jane climbed into bed with her and kissed her all over her face. Amelia later chalked this up to a dream, but when Jane came out later on and confessed to almost everything. She was like, oh, that probably wasn't a dream. That's really weird. So she then graduated at Cambridge and got a job at Massachusetts General Hospital. But she later on lost that job because she began recklessly giving out opiates, but doctors recommended her as a private nurse to some of their more wealthier patients. So outside of her job, she's known to have been extremely two-faced in that she drank a lot of alcohol. She was such a jerk to her friends, like pitting her friends against each other, all of this stuff. But when she was with doctors and patients, she was kind, professional, and respectable. So as a private nurse, Topin was earning about $25 a week while other nurses earned only an average of about $5 a week. So apparently she was a really good nurse. She got along with people super well. Now we'll move into her killing spree. So she killed at least a dozen people while working as a student nurse and her MO was kind of morphine, opium, and stuff like that. So she dosed her elderly patients with opium to see how they would react. It was kind of how she started out. And then she would up the dose and watch them suffer and die. It's said that she got like a sexual thrill from it, which is interesting because most female killers or female serial killers don't kill people for sexual satisfaction. They kill for material gain. But Jane Topin, she had nothing to gain from killing people. So she then began to use other drugs and a few times she would stage a sickness by poisoning them and then nurse them back to a miraculous recovery, which is probably why she was so popular among doctors because they thought she was great at what she did. During her time as a private nurse for families around Boston, she would kill older family members and steal their belongings. She killed her landlords because they had gotten, quote, feeble and fussy and old and cranky. And later on, colleagues in her nursing school talk about how they remember her saying that there was no use to keeping old people alive. Anyway, 1889, Mary McClear was 70 years old 
when she fell ill while visiting Cambridge. So Mary's doctor sent Jane. Jane thus poisoned her and killed her. Then a month later, Jane killed a close friend with strychnine so that she could take her job as the dining hall matron at St. John's Theological School in Cambridge. She ended up getting the job, interestingly enough, but just like her previous job history, she lost it very quickly because the administration kept getting complaints of her incompetence and they were missing a lot of money since she started working there. That's how you lose job, ladies and gentlemen. So Elizabeth, Jane's foster sister and Anne Topin's daughter, would often invite Jane to stay over at the house that Jane used to live in while she was the caretaker there and all of that. Sometimes Jane would go up there and stay at the house, but while vacationing in Buzzards Bay in the summer of 1899, Jane invited her depressed sister Elizabeth up to spend some time with her. So Jane took Elizabeth to the beach for a picnic where they had cold corned beef, taffy, and mineral water laced with strychnine. So Jane poisoned her sister Elizabeth, foster sister Elizabeth, and we have a quote from Jane talking about this murder that she had committed saying, quote, I held her in my arms and watched with delight as she gasped her life out. So after the death of Elizabeth or the murder of Elizabeth, Jane kind of placed herself in Elizabeth's spot, so to speak. She insinuated herself into Elizabeth's house because she wanted to marry Elizabeth's husband, who is now a widower. His name is Ormel. Within three days, of being at the house, she killed their housekeeper. The housekeeper's name was Edna Bannister. Edna was 77 years old, and after killing her, Jane took over for Edna and tried to impress Oramel with her housekeeping skills. Oramel made it very clear that he didn't want her as a housekeeper or as a wife. Jane then decided in order to win his love, she would poison him and then nurse him back to health. Obviously, that didn't work either. So he got super angry and threw her out of the house. It was like, never come back here. So she then decided that in her heartbreak, she would commit suicide. So she attempted to commit suicide with an overdose of morphine, but she failed and ended up going to the hospital. So she was never caught until she used a metallic based poison on a victim, which then sparked an investigation. So in 1901, a Massachusetts state detective started following her and following her story because he suspected her of killing the entire family of Aldine Davis. So Jane actually rented a cottage in Bourne from Aldine Davis, but she didn't keep her payments going, all of this stuff. In that, Davis's wife, Maddie, came to Cambridge to collect what Jane owed them. But Jane killed her with a cocktail of morphine and atropin on July 4th, 1901. So Jane then moved in with Aldine Davis, who was old and unable to take care of himself. So she moved in to take care of him after she killed his wife. So she moved in to take care of him and took care of him she did. Uh, she killed him and both of his married daughters, one of them named Mary or Minnie Gibbs, uh, who was declared dead on August 19th, and Geraldine or Annie Gordon, who was killed July 29th. So Minnie's father-in-law was very suspicious of the sudden deaths of literally the entire family. So he had Minnie's body exhumed to see what the cause of death was. It turns out that the investigation said that she died from a morphine and atrophine poisoning. Obviously, the arrows are all gonna point to who? Jane Tobin. So she was arrested by the police on October 29th, 1901. This is not dry yet. I think my roommate has a blow dryer. Kathy, can I use your blow dryer? Okay, I'm getting impatient. So she was arrested by police on October 29th, 1901. Oh, ow, ow. 1901. She was in court the summer of 1902 and while she was in court she told her attorney that she had killed at least 31 victims, perhaps more than 100. She stated that sometimes she also would get into bed with her victims as they convulsed from the poison. She also claimed that she started her killing spree because her boyfriend dumped her when she was 16. He was a Lowell office worker and she states that he gave her a promise ring but then moved to Holyoke 
Massachusetts and fell in love with someone else. And she stated that, quote, if I had been a married woman, I probably would not have killed all those people. I would have had my husband, my children, and my home to take up my mind, which that's not how that works. So nice try. So the trial took eight hours and it was held in the Barnstable County Courthouse on June 23rd, 1902. The jury deliberated for a whopping 27 minutes and they found her not guilty by reason of insanity and her history with suicide attempts helped them to come to that conclusion. She was ordered to thus spend the rest of her life at Taunton State Hospital and in this asylum slash hospital, I don't know how I feel about it parting in the middle like that. During her time in this hospital she refused to eat because she was afraid that it might be poison and the press then stated that this would be an ironic end to someone whose MO was poisoning. Some attendants remember her calling them into her room smiling and saying quote get some morphine dearie and we'll go out into the ward. You and I will have a lot of fun seeing them die. So she stayed in the asylum until she died on August 17th, 1938, at the age of 84. There was a media resurgence of the story after her death, claiming her to be America's first serial killer. So, I know this was a shorter episode than last time, but I don't have much hair and therefore don't have much story time. So, thank you all for watching. If you don't mind to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, all that kinds of fun stuff, comment. If you want to, tell me who you want to hear about next. It doesn't always have to be women. That's just who I've done the past two months. So yeah, thanks for watching.